This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is the best-selling author of The 4-Hour Workweek, The 4-Hour Body, The 4-Hour Chef. He's otherwise known as the guy that has revolutionized the idea of writing a book. Regardless of subject, Tim Ferriss has engineered the process of a bestseller. As a guy that's written five books that have sold nowhere near the copies that Tim has sold, I love learning. I love looking and seeing what someone else has done that I did not think about, that I did not execute. If you want to write a book, there is absolutely no one else better to learn from. Heck, even if you don't have a chance to meet him, talk to him, just observe from afar. Observe his actions. There's a second big influence that Tim Ferriss has had on my life. Location independence. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, Tim made it okay. I mean, I've always known I could be location independent, and I've done it. But Tim made it really okay that if you had your laptop, you had your cell phone, that you could work from anywhere. I mean, there's a massive movement of people around the world that have said, I've had enough of the cube, I've had enough of the desk jockey stuff, and I'm going to be anywhere. I'm one of those people. I'm always appreciative that I had a chance to be influenced in this direction. And Tim's definitely partially, if not all, responsible for the initial idea. And I'm not the only person that would say that. A ton of people would say that. Now, after all these best-selling books, Tim has a TV show coming out, The Tim Ferriss Experiment. Again, a real simple concept, and it reminds me of the Turtle Trader Experiment. Basically, Tim has to learn a lot of different things really fast, a few days, and the world gets to see the results. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Tim Ferriss. Hey, Tim, how are you? I am doing very well. You're in Saigon. Yeah, battling some kind of Southeast Asian hit you in the stomach. Man, I'm not happy. Where is the Cipro feeling right now? <laughs> oh, man, yeah. I've been there. I've been there. I spent a week in the Calcutta ER with something like that, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, I hope you feel better. Sorry well, to hear thank that. You, sir. Here's how we came to talk today. I think you might find this somewhat fun. So we briefly met about four years ago at your Napa Kimono event. And yeah. so there was an opening night, something or another, and my friend Tim Sykes had got me to come to your, to your event. And so afterwards, there was like people sitting down to eat, and there was a table with two guys, and Sykes must have known who they were. I didn't, and he motioned to sit there. And I don't think he knew them, but he knew who they were. So we, we sat at this table, and we sit down, and there was one guy, and he was really quiet. He didn't say a word. The other guy looks at Sykes and I and immediately says, what the hell are you two doing with yourself? Look at you. Are you you're out of shape. What are you eating? What are you doing to yourself? And just lays the biggest, <laughs> the biggest, you're going to know, the biggest tough love thing you've ever heard from a complete stranger. Yeah. And that was how I became friends of Tucker Max. I was going to say I had to be Tucker. <laughs> yeah. <it's, laughs> trademark Tucker. And the quiet, the quiet guy was Ryan. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of Ryan's MO. So <laughs> he's like the, the, he's like Tucker Max's uh, Carl Rove. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was, it was fun. And you know, that we, we became friends, you know, so they've, they both appeared on my podcast. So it's been cool. And that was kind of randomly how we, we came to talk today. But I got to tell you, the, the, here's how I prepare to talk to you today. And not, not just because I had read about it only, been, I actually knew who he was because I grew up with three brothers who were wrestlers. I prepared to talk to you today by watching an hour-long Dan Gable documentary. 
Ah, nice. Which one is that? The competitor supreme? It was the ES. It was on ESPN, like a forty-five minute one. Oh, I, I must have to. I have to find that. Yeah, that's a different one. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice. So, why is Dan Gable probably even to this day? Why is Dan Gable part of your drive? And who is he? Define him for the audience. Yeah, Dan Gable is uh, the sportsman of the century, according to Sports Illustrated at one point. He is uh, one of the most successful, if not the most successful uh, coach in the history of almost any sport in the United States. Uh, and he started as a wrestler himself. He went undefeated except for one match in his entire NCAA career. His last match, which he lost by points, and he had read the scoreboard incorrectly. That made him so upset that he he trained for the Munich Olympics seven hours a day, seven days a week, and then won the gold medal without having a single point scored on him. Uh, that is impossible, but he did it. That is something akin to winning Wimbledon without having a point scored on you. It does not happen. And uh, they, when people thought he was at the top of his game, couldn't possibly do anything to... Uh, supersede that he then proceeded to coach in Iowa and produce you know 200 plus all Americans one I think I'm making up these numbers but it's something like it's like 13 big Ted titles in a row produced multiple Olympians he he was just the mutant factory owner and he was so good at creating a machine of such extreme dominance that people in every other sport started to take notice even though wrestling is typically kind of the redheaded stepchild that doesn't get any attention or appreciation um, that has changed a lot with mma but back in the day even when it was uh, viewed as a very sort of secondary sport compared to all of the big team sports Dan Gable has just been a living legend and has been ever since. So I, I have had him as an icon in my mind for so long. He uh, just through serendipity ended up connecting with me. And I actually had dinner with him a few months ago, which was extremely surreal. And at one point he said to me, you know, I could still kick your ass right now. And I was like, yes, I'm very well aware, Dan, that you could probably still almost certainly kick my ass. If you had like one arm and one leg, I think you could still kick my ass. Uh, but he is a fascinating character. And the, um, the documentary I'll have to chase down, Competitor Supreme was basically my... I don't know what to, I would even call it, my source of inspiration and enthusiasm and aggression when I was wrestling. And even when I was an exchange student overseas in Japan and trying to learn Japanese, I would watch this, This uh, I think it was sponsored by ASICS at the time, but you can probably find it online. I watched you use this video and I watched it over and over again because it's just about kind of pushing yourself through the pain and using aggression to win your battles and offense is the best def defense and so on. And there's a, there's a post I put up later to try to give people a taste of this called Ode to Aggression, which is a blog post I wrote about Dan Gable with a clip from that, <laughs> which has the great line. He's lecturing his team after a meet and he's really upset with this one guy who got a tie and he said, you just didn't want to lose to him before. He'd beat you twice before. And so you got a tie and that's what you get when you when you just don't want to lose you never win that way you know and i was yeah. like oh man sage advice so i uh i find that but that grinding that grinding aspect to wrestling and i grew up with three brothers who were wrestlers so i wasn't in a terrible number of fights in my life but you know a lot of young guys when they want to fight for the first time there's a fight they stand up and they pretend they're a boxer i was smart enough to always go for the knees and get on the ground at least from 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 my from my minor wrestling training but talk about the grinding aspect of wrestling and how that has played out through your career because i think if anyone's pays close attention to your career it is a grinding. It's not like, oh, I'm just a guy that just did this and gets all this attention. No, it's a it's a grind. It's a slow grind of, I mean, even if I look at your, I tell people, they say, hey, I, I want to write a book. And I've, I've written books, but they say, I want to write a book and I want to market. I say, listen, I don't know if you know who Tim Ferriss is or not, but just go look at what he's doing for writing and marketing his books and do some modeling. But talk about the grinding aspect of your career, Tim. Well, I think that it's, you know, th there's the grinding, which is just the slow sanding down of the edge of the axe over time and uh, the sort of chafing off of <laughs> the sort of mental and physiological and psychological equivalents of like bone spurs, which sounds really painful and it is. Um, and those are, those are, I think, developed uh, or the, the stick-to-itiveness and grit of wrestling helps you to contend with scenarios that seem lost. And I think part of the reason that is you can be losing 
just by a landslide in a wrestling match and pin your opponent. There is always the opportunity, unless you get tech falled, to turn it around and win the match. I think that that has translated to many other areas of my life. And the four hour work week, for instance, was turned down by, I don't even remember how many, between 26 and 29 publishers violently. I mean, it was not, it was not the uh, self evident at all that the book would do anything. And it had an initial print run, I think, of 12,000 copies and had to change the title and all these different things happened. And it was, it was not a smooth takeoff. Uh, and uh, none of, none of the projects that I focused on that have really done well have been a smooth takeoff. It's been a lot of false starts, a lot of correcting course, a lot of last minute catastrophes that have had to be covered for. A lot of that comes from, I think, the belief even when perhaps it's an erroneous belief that, you know, this, this, there's always a way to turn it around. As Thomas Edison has said, you know, if, if you've, once you've looked at all of the options, just remember you haven't. <laughs> and, uh, that ethos, I think has, has aided me greatly. Perhaps it's delusional, but it's delusional in at least a very productive way. Well, that slides us into today. And I can think back several years ago. I spent three years of my life traveling the world, making a documentary film with a, a full crew and the whole nine yards. And now here you are, and you've gone from a guy who's saying, okay, let's write some best-selling books. Now, you, now you're really getting the pain, <laughs> making a TV show. That's no joke. Yeah, That's no joke. <laughs> and not only the pain, just from the physical stuff that you're doing, but why don't you talk about the idea of walking in? Obviously, you've had some experience at TV and production and stuff like that. But now here you are doing a show, putting yourself front and center. What are some of those, uh, those initial early lessons that you start to understand about making a TV show? Well, the, the first lesson I learned was you have to say no for a long time to actually get any creative control. And what I mean by that is I said no to almost every television option that came to me because I didn't have any real desire to simply have my face in more places. That wasn't interesting to me. So doing, you know, the real housewife makeover of such and such County was not interesting. Uh, if I, ha if I didn't have any say in what was done in the editing room, uh, or just from the very outset, conceptually, I, I was not interested. And so I had uh, Turner Broadcasting come to me at one point, and uh, Chris, who was there at the time, asked me something I'd never been asked by a TV person, which was, if you could do anything, what would you want to do? And I said, well, that is very interesting. Number one, I would want to be an executive producer, not just a host. I would want to have these following veto powers and creative inputs so that I can protect what I've worked so hard to build. You know, I think that I would want to do, you know, a couple of options. First option is a show that demonstrates how far you can push accelerated learning and human performance. And the format would be me sort of testing myself to the breaking point with these world-class performers and different skills and showing the toolkit that anyone can use. Then I said, the second idea would be a show about how to become Jason Bourne. <laughs> and I was like, and then third, I said, I would only want to do something that I would want to watch myself. And I don't watch a lot of TV, but there are, there's one production company that made No Reservations by Anthony Bourdain, which I loved, and Mind of a Chef, which I also loved, I would want to make something gritty and cinematic like that. And we were able to do basically all three um, with the Tim Ferriss experiment. But what I realized, let's see, about making good TV. Wow, how deep do we want to go here? The first is take whatever time you think it's going to take and multiply it by four. Uh, that's number one. And then if you want to make nonfiction television, you have to recognize from the very outset, and I say nonfiction instead of reality, because reality television is all bullshit. It is, it is completely scripted. And yeah, it's one hundred percent scripted. One hundred percent scripted. You know that based on just the amount of time they take to record the shows, uh, and you also know that because you see all these weird scenes, like these big arguments in the kitchen, for instance, where people are just standing around in the kitchen and there's always one person mixing some, some, uh, mystery liquid. <laughs> and they do that because it's easy to film natural light. That never happens in real life. Let's face it. Like you don't have six people standing in the kitchen, having an, uh, having a debate. It just, that's not how homes work. So to, to do this show, we were filming 
and you've been in production, so you know. I mean, this was beyond anything I've ever done. So we not only were we filming uh, 12 to 16 hours a day, um, and doing that five days a week, typically, and having to cut that down, that down to 22 minutes, we had to review footage as an, well, I had to, as a producer, review rough cuts, send back notes, do all of this prep. Then on top of that, we, and this is suicidal, but we did, we filmed probably 13 of these episodes in 16 weeks. And what that meant was we'd go just breakneck cramming with these experiments and testing and, and footage. And oftentimes I'm getting injured or face planting and really screw myself up because, you know, this, like I said, it's not a smooth takeoff. Like learning anything in a short period of time has a lot of hiccups. We do that. Then Saturday would be travel day where we would, we'd move, you know, a whole crew and 27 boxes of gear and blah, blah, blah to whatever our next location was. And then Sunday would be planning for Monday and we'd start all over again. So if you want a four hour work week, definitely TV is not, <laughs> at least in the traditional sense, not the right option. You know, but- I think, I think sometimes though, it's funny you mentioned that about the four hour work week. I think sometimes people, I hear people say, Oh, that's, all BS and this and that. And, and you know, I think it's unfair because I looked at it, I always looked at it like, okay, Tim is not saying exactly four hours. It could be four hours and 15 minutes, but you get the point. And the, and the thing is, it's can you reduce the amount of time that you're spending, which is probably an infinite amount of extra baloney time? Can you reduce that down, get more efficient, and get freedom? Anyone that thinks that's impossible, I like, I like, don't want to talk to you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, it's, I, and, and I don't run into people who've read the book who, who have a problem with the title because they understand the intention, which is fundamentally, I guess, uh, number one, I agree with what you just said, but also it's about 10xing your hourly input and, or hourly output, rather. It's about 10xing your hourly output. And once you do that, you can then choose, once you have systems and behaviors and routines in place, you can then choose what to do with your time. And whether that is cutting from 40 down to four, whether that is doing the same number of hours, but having 10 X the output, whether that's working 80 hours a week because you love what you're doing are all fair options. But the point is you, you develop a high degree of leverage and optionality when you have a portfolio of techniques for time management and systems, uh, development and automating of processes and, and delegation of minutia, et cetera. That provides options, and options are power. So that's uh, that's definitely where I land. I mean, I am I am Type A. I love building things. I can do it. Very fortunate to be in a position where I can do whatever I want at this point, and I choose to create because I enjoy it. And trust me, I mean, you can tell people this as well. But like, if you want to make a ton of money, television also not really a great great way to do it <laughs> at, at all. I mean, most of the hosts that you see on TV, ninety nine percent of them, even very popular hosts are making next to nothing. They're using TV as a lead generator for other things. For all of those reasons, I mean, I had to do this for kind of the love of the the creation and the end product. There's no other way around it. And I mean, the, I, what I wanted to do was take the most compelling, important concepts from all three books, 4-Hour Workweek, 4-Hour Body, and 4-Hour Chef for the accelerated learning piece and kind of put them into living color in the most dramatic compelling way possible. I think we succeeded, you know, it was, it was, I mean, we had to go through hell and back to do it. I mean, it was really hard on everybody, but at the end of the day, we got out what we put in, which was a lot of effort. Very fortunate to have worked with an incredible crew of folks who just made it look amazing. So very happy with it. I've seen it said the mantra of the new show, which is called the Tim Ferriss experiment. You don't need to be superhuman to get superhuman results. You just need a better toolkit Philosophically, part of your better toolkit starts with the 80-20 rule. For those that, uh, look, a lot of my audience is going to have heard, heard about the 80-20 rule, but why don't you explain it from your perspective and perhaps who first turned you on to it? How far back in time do we go? You know, that's a good, I'm going to answer the second one first. And the short answer is I don't know. I, I may have come across writing uh, by... Um, Richard, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, so I won't massacre it. K-O-C-H. There are a lot of ways to go there. I'll say Coke, who did a lot of writing on the 8020 principle, but I think it came well before that and actually being turned on to Vilfredo Pareto, the originator of Pareto's law, which is is commonly known as the 8020 principle, uh, probably through college in economics, uh, or perhaps even sociology, but the 
The general principle is pretty simple. So Wilfredo Pareto, who was, I believe he's a Swiss-Italian economist slash sociologist, noticed that the distribution of wealth was very asymmetrical. You notice that uh, something like 80% of the land or 90% of the land, and I think Switzerland was owned by less than 20% of the population. He also noticed, though, that this applied to, for instance, his garden, where there were 20% of the pea plants produced 80% of the pods and peas. And he began to look for this type of disproportionate output for a lesser input in all sorts of different areas. And the way that I apply this, or many people apply this now to two different areas would be, say, looking at your customer or product mix, if you're an entrepreneur, for instance. So what are the 20% of customers that produce 80% or more of your revenue or your profit? You can use this in the opposite or I should say conversely also. So what, who are the 20% of customers that consume 80% or more of your time? And you, and the, the fascinating part is when you do a comparison like that, you, you don't find a lot of overlap. <laughs> the customers who tend to be the most promising are also the lower maintenance customers, oftentimes, not always. This can be applied to your life on a more personal basis where, and I do this whenever I'm feeling overwhelmed in any capacity or over anxious, an 80-20 analysis where I will look at what are the 20% of activities, commitments, people in my life who are producing 80% or more of my negative emotions, you know, anxiety, anger, etc. I use that as a lens through which I view almost anything that I'm doing or experiencing. And it's very helpful. I typically do it with a pad, a pad of paper and a, and a pen. It's, it does not require anything high tech, does not require wearing a jawbone or some fancy self-tracking device. It's, it's a very simple but elegant exercise. You know, I want to offer one, I know you've got the first season filmed, but my second book was a story about a very famous trader who took People, students, young people in their early 20s that answered one ads in the Wall Street Journal in the early 1980s. And he had made $200 million by the age of 37. He put these ads in the paper. These students responded. He gave them two weeks of training, set them off on their own down the street in Chicago from his main office. Four years later, the group of 20 students selected him, made about $100 million profit. 25 years later, six of them are still trading for clients if... At some point in time, Mr. Ferris, if you want some introductions to people that might have fun trying to train you in trading, I can give you more than one, that's for sure. That is a, that is a fascinating offer. Let me ruminate on that. I mean, these sandboxes are all interesting to me. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I was looking at your list. I was like, okay, trading is going to be in this list at some point in time. And I was thinking, well, even on the second season, maybe he's even got ideas already. Listen, parkour, I, I mean, I guess I've seen the pictures and the images of it, but this is insane. And you, you, yeah. you, you, you've seriously, there's a slightly screw loose that you're even attempting that, isn't there? Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And in retrospect, that was uh, a lot of these episodes had an element of danger. I mean, surfing with Laird Hamilton, a king, undisputed king of big wave surfing was one. Uh, the rally car racing, I mean, where you're flying down roads that are uh, oftentimes literally eight to 12 feet wide with, with trees and rocks on the sides. Those were all dangerous. Uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I think I broke one of my floating ribs doing that this uh, during that episode. Uh, but the parkour was by far the most dangerous and I suffered some tremendous injuries. And for people who aren't familiar with parkour, maybe you've seen American Ninja Warrior or Ninja Warrior. It's basically like taking the skills of a ninja, an acrobat, and a break dancer and trying to use them as you jump from like building to building and effectively the chase scene in Casino Royale at the very beginning, if anyone has seen that, and or District 9. Yes, I suffered some some pretty catastrophic injuries that are that are captured on camera. What a lot of people don't realize because it ended up being finished and edited much later was that was the first episode that we shot. So I had so many injuries carrying through this entire season. It was unbelievable. Uh, but yes, parkour, probably a little too aggressive <laughs> in terms of uh, selection because it's so heavily attribute dependent. You can't, you can't just have a theoretical understanding of these things. You have to have connective tissue and so on that can accommodate the, the impact forces and so on that you're dealing with. So I, in retrospect, probably shouldn't have done parkour. Uh, certainly shouldn't have done it as the first episode, but you know, live and learn, as they I, say. I don't ask this from a kind of a weird curiosity, but I guess we're talking about the physical stuff. You're in your thirties, right? 
I am 37. Okay, so it in late 30s, you, you start to feel those. The recovery time starts to appear, at least for me, starts to appear. I'm in my mid-40s. It starts to appear in your late 30s. I think that recovery time, I think it's why all the baseball players wanted to take steroids in the steroid age was for recovery. But uh, talk about some of that. The, I mean, give some advice to the audience because there's a lot of people, a lot of guys in my audience and uh, some very successful ones. But talk about the idea of getting older in recovery and athletics, give some good tips. You've done the homework. You know the I have, insights. I have done homework. Yeah, so there are a few things I would say. Number one is the best way to get injured as a an aging male, if you sit down a lot in particular, is to try to go to a track and run uh, because you're taking your hamstrings to the extreme end range of the movement. You're going to pull a hamstring, and that's a very bad injury. It takes a long time to heal typically. So the first recommendation I would make if you're trying to mitigate injury and maintain some degree of athletic performance and recovery is, number one, have a mobility practice of some type. And uh, Kelly Starrett is is a great person to follow with this. Uh, he is Mobility Wad, W-O-D. That's his his company. Uh, have a basic, you know, 10 to 15 minute mobility practice that you use to effectively test and uh, inc- test your joints and expand your functional range of movement. Um, this is not the same as stretching necessarily. And I think that for older guys who try to hold stretches too long every day or every other day, that is one of the primary causes of being as stiff as they are. They, they are they're actually holding stretches too long. So going to an, a, a comfortable end range of movement and then coming out of that position uh, repeatedly, I think does more oftentimes than holding a 60 second stretch where you end up doing a lot of uh, causing a lot of micro trauma. The second thing I would say is you have to ensure your your nutrition is on point. And a very simple first step is making sure that you consume 30 grams of protein within 30 minutes of waking up. And 30 grams of protein could be, say, three or four hard-boiled eggs and some lentils out of a can. If you're lazy like I am, hard-boiled eggs and some lentils out of a can. Or it could be, uh, say, a whey protein, uh, protein isolate uh, if you're taking a shake. Now, the shake isn't ideal just because whey protein, for instance, is basically a, a, the simple sugar of proteins. It will spike your insulin levels. But you could consume say you know, a tablespoon or two of coconut oil before you have it and that will blunt your insulin response a little bit so th- those would be two suggestions right off the bat and i would say consider uh, if you have never done this if you're suffering from older injuries or lingering chronic injuries consider something called active release technique art which is a form of myofascial release uh, that d- effectively removes adherences between adjacent uh, muscle tissue, uh, for the most part. I mean, there, there are other types, but that is also something as like a, a creaky dude that, um, or a woman for that matter, but guys tend to be more belligerent with themselves and have less self-preservation. So we end up with a lot more scar tissue because we're just retarded. Um, so I would say those would be a couple of recommendations right off the bat. You know, obviously your passion right now is the new show and creating everything and, and getting out and talking about it. But your real passion is where I just asked, because clearly I just wound you up for a second, and I knew I could see you could have gone for hours in that direction. Yeah, you know, I think about this stuff all the time. So, and the and the physical stuff, I mean, was is a big component of everything that I do. I mean, if you if you're writing a 500 page book. Uh, and you have a tight deadline, you need to manage your your physical machine very, very carefully. You I mean because there are limits to which or there are limits to yeah, and limits to which you can replenish, for instance, neurotransmitters on a short time turnaround. So how do you supplement to facilitate that if you have to cram? If you are trying to, for instance, learn a language in three or four days well enough to do a six minute interview on live television in Filipino, which is one of the episodes, you have sort of uh, biochemical substrates in your brain that you will deplete just as you would deplete glycogen in your liver or your muscles from doing a very long bike ride. And you have to manage all of that. So these are, these are things that uh, are not separate from the mind. I think that physical and mental are separated oftentimes, but the, the systems upon which both of those depend are the same. 
you know, for mental performance, the coconut oil that I mentioned, for instance, gets converted into, well, it's, the, the MCT is the medium chain triglycerides get converted into ketones very readily by the liver. So if you're doing what I'm doing right now, which is consuming very few carbohydrates, so I'm in a state of ketosis, I can have a cup of tea with a tablespoon of coconut oil melted into it. And I feel like I've had three cups of coffee. It's a hell of a trick. So <laughs> these are also uh, a, a lot of, that's part of the portfolio of techniques that goes into uh, all the episodes in the show as well. And I have a, I have a lot of bonus footage that I'm going to share that relates to the recovery and like what my suitcase contains. I had an entire suitcase just for recovery stuff. <laughs> so I go through that and some of the bonus videos. Uh, I, I will definitely be, I'll be watching the recovery stuff. I'm struggling with it these days. Hey, Tim, we got to, I, I can't keep you. We got to run. I want to uh, let everybody know the particulars. The show, the Tim Ferriss experiment will be premiering. It would be April 28th. So by the time people hear this, uh, we should have not just one, but every episode of the show up House of Cards style on ah. iTunes. So I'm putting everything out at once and you can pick and choose. You can get the whole season for like 50% off, which of course would be my, my hope that you watch them all. If you go to iTunes.com forward slash Tim Ferriss with two R's and two S's, you should be able to find it. And then for links to all that stuff, as well as bonus footage from the show that got cut and interviews, extended interviews, uh, people can go to fourhourworkweek.com forward slash TV, all spelled out, F-O-U-R, fourhourworkweek.com forward slash TV. Tim, at some point in time in the future, when you're when you when you're having a rest, I want to have you on just to talk long form about recovery, just recovery. Yeah, I, I think yeah, I think too, you man. could go well there. Hey, listen, man, I appreciate you taking the time today, and hopefully, we can catch up in the future. I appreciate you having me on, and uh, once I recover from the TV show, I'll have a whole new set of notes to share with you. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Take care, man. Yeah. All right, have a good one. Bye, bye. Take care. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right Trend Following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, Trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.